Hi, I'm Scott Hamilton, Rockfile, back with another podcast review for your ears. It's time to revisit the sequel, Mechanic Resurrection. I remember the original Mechanic movie from the 70s because my dad was a Charles Bronson fan. So I had seen that movie at least more than once. And rewatched recently the remake, the Mechanic remake with Jason Statham and Ben Foster, and thought it was, it should have been better. It really should have. I mean, it's, it was okay. But like I said in that review, when you put Ben Foster in a movie, you know he's going to stab you in the back at some point. It's just, it's what that actor does. It's what he's really good at. And by the end of the movie, it just felt like the, the, the idea had been a little watered down. It could have used a little injection of some John Wick-isms, and this was before John Wick came out. So I remember picking up The Mechanic Resurrection because I had read mediocre reviews about it, but it was like, I don't know, seven ninety nine on a Black Friday on 4K, and I was like, well, it'll look good, right? <laughs> so I bought it and watched it. And thought it was okay, and it sat on the shelf. That This was five years ago, and I really forgot all about it, other than some of the people who were in it. I remember Jessica Alba being in it way too much. <laughs> not that I have a problem with her. She just really doesn't, I mean, other than a damsel in distress, she's not a major character in the film. I mean, she's a plot point. She drives the story, but, you know, she could have been in it or not. The, it's an R-rated movie, but the sex scene is PG-13. And anyway... So I rewatched Mechanic Resurrection after five years of not seeing this movie and to bring you this review. And, you know, I didn't know much about the director. He's a German director and he's directed like a vampire movie before this and some political movies and some TV movies and some shorts. I don't... What I just said about the first one needing some John Wickisms, this is 2016. They did inject some John Wickisms in this. There's plenty of headshots. There's a lot more gunfire than the first one. There is a lot more action than the first one. It looks great in 4K. The HDR, it's an upconvert, I believe, but it, it really does look good. It's got Dolby Atmos on the 4K and the Blu-ray, and the soundtrack is great. There was a lot of motion, a lot of movement around my head and things like that. Jason Statham makes the movie. Jessica Alba could be interchangeable with any beautiful actress. Um, Tommy Lee Jones is in the movie briefly. His character, you know, they kind of lead at the end of the movie that there may be a, a possible continuation of this. Michelle Yeoh is in the movie, who's one of my favorite action stars, and she doesn't get to do a whole lot in the movie. Um and it's got some great set pieces. The, it's got a bad guy who is kind of generic. He just, the, he doesn't, Crane just doesn't feel like, you know, he's a generic European bad guy with an accent and they know something about the past, but he talks a lot of crap through the whole movie. And then when in the end, when it comes down to a fight scene, Statham wipes the boat up with him, you know? I mean, it's just, it's not even close. Um, and this was supposed to be the big foil throughout the entire movie. Uh, Sam Hazeldine is the the villain. He was on like Prime Suspect 6 and things like that. He's made a lot of British television movies. He's done theater. And he has made quite a few movies, but he's just, just wasn't, I don't know, just wasn't uh, imposing enough to be the villain in this. Movie had a forty million dollar budget, which I believe is quite a bit more than the first one. It went on to make one hundred and twenty five million dollars, um, more than well, almost half of it in China, which is interesting. I guess that's why the Michelle Yeoh stuff is in there. We talked about this in reviews of the Meg and a few other movies that have come out. That when some of these Hollywood movies get Chinese financing, all of a sudden there's like a subplot with a famous Chinese actor in it, or a couple of famous Chinese actors, and. Like in the Meg, it felt really forced. In this one, not so much. This plays out more like a James Bond movie. More like the first movie should have. Matter of fact, in a little retrospect, I think the first movie suffered from the same problem that I think the original Mission Impossible suffers from. In the original Mission Impossible, we're introduced to the team who are all killed off in the first 15 minutes, and the rest of the movie is one member of the team trying to figure out what happened, find the bad guys, and... and 
it, it wasn't until Mission Impossible 2 that we started putting a team back together and, and, and 3 where we, it really solidified what Mission Impossible really was about. And so with the mechanic, we had, you know, the introduction of the character and this background and the and the plot twists and the people, you know, which would have played better had we had like an introductory movie with his adventures and then got into some personal stuff. You know what I mean? Anyway. I don't know what the problem was with the first one, but this one just amped everything up more and that helped it. But overall, it's 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 kind of a bit of a mess as well. It some of the fight scenes, some of the action scenes are incredibly well filmed. Great cinematography, great choreography. Other things are just edited kind of sloppily and kind of thrown together. And it feels like this is more a series of set pieces interconnected with the Finn story, like a lot of sequels and action movies are. Overall, it's an easy watch. It's highly entertaining. It just could have been so much better. I mean, this could have been, this could have blown the first one out of the water and continued this franchise for quite some time. Again, it's Jason Statham. If you're a fan, he makes the movie. He He's the reason to watch the film. Everybody else does good with what they have. It just doesn't all come together in like a, uh, wow, you know, like a Daniel Craig 007 movie when you're done. It does have a similar kind of ending where you think the main character dies and, and it looks like he hasn't, so there could be a third one. Uh, what happens with one of the main characters would lead you to believe that this is going to come back to bite him in the butt maybe in the next movie. But as of five years later, they have not made a third mechanic movie. If If they stayed with this formula and maybe got an action director who was a little more, uh, you know, up to speed. It's one of the questions that have plagued me throughout my movie-loving career, my movie-loving life, because I, I love movies. And I will go to see a movie, and every once in a while, the studio finds this new young director, and they give him a big budget, and it works out. It's great. That's really rare, though. A lot of times, these studios find these hot young directors, they give them a big budget, and the movie turns out just okay. You can look up a long list of movies where these directors were not ready to get the kind of budget they were handed and turn out things that are just not quite um, where they should be. And the movies fail and, and sometimes franchises end and things like that. And I've always wondered what conversations go on. Okay, hey, we've got this $100 million budget, but we're going to give it to this guy who or girl, whoever, who's only made music videos and TV commercials. <laughs> I've just always wondered about that thinking. But that being said, I'm sure there's a lot of people that can found who have done worse. The guy tried to make a legit uh, Mission Impossible light kind of film, James Bond light kind of film, and did a pretty darn good job. A lot of action, great set pieces, beautiful to look at, good actors. Just doesn't all quite come together in a great movie. It's just a good one. And if it's streaming and you want to watch it, Great. If you can check it out in 4K with HDR and the full Dolby Atmos surround sound, it is a much better experience than the first one. The first one looked a little gritty, had a had a more lossy soundtrack and just was okay. This sounds and looks like a modern movie, very exciting, very big. And it's Jason Statham showcase. I mean, that's what it really is. I just wish the rest of the movie. It's not a long movie. It's fairly short. It still could have had a little bit of trimming. Seems like we're trying to fit in some drama beats to make us a legitimate movie when it could just kind of let things go and, and be what it wants to be, be what it really wants to be and what it should be. So it's a sequel that is arguably a hair better than the original in some ways and would lead to an interesting franchise. I would be interested to watch Jason Statham play this if they got, you know, some of the guys that are involved in, in the John Wick or Deadpool movies to just amp it up a little bit or, you know, something else. Do something a little different. Let's let's take it up a notch because this is close, but you could really get there. And hopefully maybe they will. I don't know. Uh, I'm looking forward to Hobbs and Shaw, too, for a Jason Statham performance. And at least they rebooted the transporter he's not making those anymore anyway i'm scott hamilton rockfile my website is therockfile.com please like share subscribe hit the notification bell and all those good things thank you so much for listening have a spectacular day